Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Sashi Varanasi. I'm the Worldwide Specialist Solutions Architecture Leader for In-Memory Databases at AWS. Joining me today is Roberto Luna Rojas, who is our Specialist Solutions Architect. Today, we are excited to talk to you about how you can boost your PostgreSQL application performance with Amazon Elastic Ash. Before we get started, here is a quick list of topics we will cover. We will talk to you about the challenges of relational databases, which is the problem we are trying to address. We will then dive into caching concepts and caching best practices. We will cover Redis data structures at a high level. We will then spend time on the demo application that Roberto is eager to show you. Let's look at performance and scaling limitations of relational databases. Today, as you know, every company is going through digital transformation and modernizing their current applications. As businesses grow, the applications and databases need to scale to handle the growth. The requirement is not only handling high volumes of data, but also support high application performance. Due to the complexity of the underlying architecture of the relational database systems, it is hard to horizontally scale them, and it is hard to scale them back down. As the data grows, the joins and the self-joins make the queries extremely complex and slow to perform too. One way we handle this performance need in relational databases is by adding more read replicas. The addition of read replicas, though, adds to the total cost for your applications. So we need a better solution to solve this performance and the cost problems of relational databases. So how does caching help with these problems? When you implement a cache, your data that is on the disk can be stored in the cache that is on the main memory. And because the data is in the memory, you get predictable performance. Memory is at least 50 times faster than SSDs. Your performance for the reads and the writes is now in microseconds, not in milliseconds. In other words, a database cache supplements your primary database by removing unnecessary pressure on it, typically in the form of frequently accessed read data. The cache itself can live in a number of areas, including your database, application, or a standalone layer, which is then a remote cache. Cache data is always stored in memory, providing that predictable performance. The read and the write latency is in microseconds. Elastic Cache is the solution for this problem because it will eliminate the need to repeatedly read the same data from your primary relational database. It meets the performance requirements better because it is an in-memory data store. Let's now take some time to compare in-memory and the disk-based systems. Here is a quick comparison of characteristics of disk and the memory-based systems. The traditional databases are disk-based systems. The writes and the reads for a disk are significantly slower than that of memory. The latency for the disk writes and disk reads is usually one of the primary reasons for a slow performance. The disk-based databases are I.O. bound, and it depends upon their IOPS, which is input-output operations per second capacity. The latency for the disk-based databases is in milliseconds, whereas the latency for in-memory databases is in microseconds. The performance bottleneck for disk databases is the disk itself, whereas the performance bottleneck for in-memory databases is usually the network. The disk-based database throughput is usually moderate, whereas the in-memory database can support high throughput. Disk-based relational databases usually have strict schemas and data models, whereas the in-memory systems have rich data structures. So we just looked at how memory-based data stores provide predictable performance, enabling high throughput. Before we dive deeper into memory-based caching service, which is Elastic Cache, let's take a quick step back to look at AWS purpose-built databases. In AWS, there are 15 purpose-built databases that you can choose from. 
long before we used to use one single database for multiple applications. Today, we use different databases for different purposes. The in-memory databases are one type of purpose-built databases available. There are three in-memory data services here, ElastiCache for MemcacheD, ElastiCache for Redis, and Amazon MemoryDB. The purpose of in-memory databases is to offer you the microsecond read latency and high throughput. Just quickly on MemoryDB, which is a new service that has been recently launched, it provides high durability and consistency features, and so it can be used to store any mission-critical data. That means it can be used as a primary database for many use cases. Whereas the primary use case for Elastic Cache is caching, and any use case that needs to store ephemeral data and needs high throughput and performance can, can use Elastic Cache. Stated simply, Amazon Elastic Cache plays a unique role in our purpose built strategy in that it's about working side by side with one or more of the disk based AWS relational or NoSQL databases. It's really straightforward. Add a cache for dramatic performance improvement to enable drawing from multiple data sources and to introduce a richly featured in-memory data store that allows application developers to enable real-time data analytics across a variety of use cases. Think of Elastic Cache as the first responder for application data feeds, taking a lot of pressure off the primary data stores while turbocharging your application performance. Caching concepts. Let's start with caching concepts and dive deeper into Elastic Cache for Redis. Elastic Cache is a remote cache. Remote caches are stored on dedicated servers, as shown here, running on EC2 and typically built upon key value NoSQL stores such as Redis and Memcached. They provide hundreds of thousands to up to a million requests per second per cache node. Many solutions such as what we see here on Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis provide the high availability needed for critical workloads. Also, the average latency of a request to a remote cache is fulfilled in a sub-millisecond response time which is orders of magnitude faster than a disk-based database. And since the remote cache works as a connected cluster that can be leveraged by all your disparate systems, they're ideal for distributed environments. The primary advantage is improving query response, relieving pressure from your underlying RDS, allowing it to handle new workloads. Basically, it is addressing the database challenges that we talked about earlier. Slowness of disk-based databases and the cost. Let's look at slowness and cost again to understand how it is addressed. Slowness is ad addressed because you are eliminating the need to run slow processing queries by reading their responses from the cache. While there are a number of query optimization techniques and schema designs that can help, boost your query performance, the data, data retrieval speed from the disk and the added query processing times generally will put your query response times in double digit millisecond speeds at best. This is true for high volume applications. So reading from cache will eliminate this latency. On cost front, we are able to scale better whether the data is distributed in a disk-based NoSQL database or vertically scaled up in a relational database, scaling for extremely high reads can be costly and may require a number of database read replicas to match what a single in-memory cache node can deliver in terms of request per second. So by reading from cache, you would support the high throughput without needing to spawn several read replicas for your database reducing the cost and reducing the burden on your primary database so that it can focus on other workloads. You can further improve your in-memory data access by creating optimized key value index lookups based on in-memory microsecond latency. 
Now, can we cache more than just relational database queries? Yes, we can. The data can be coming from RDS, S3, Redshift, or an API call where you're retrieving data from an underlying database or a legacy application. That result can be cached in ElastiCache. In this diagram that you're seeing, caching layer is on top of different primary data stores. You're seeing Redshift on top. Amazon Redshift is a fully managed petabyte scale data warehouse service in the cloud. You can offload repeated queries and reduce latency for Redshift with ElastiCache. The second one that you're seeing here is Amazon S3. It's an object storage service that offers scalability, data availability, security, and performance. You can speed up access uh, to S3 by caching objects and limit the API calls. The third one here is RDS, which may be running one of the six available engines, Aurora, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, Oracle, or SQL Server. Elasticache is layered on top of RDS, running on EC2 instances, and we can cache to store the results sets and eliminate the load on your RDS and improve performance. API call responses can also be cached as well. As you can see here with the API gateway, you can reduce the number of calls made to your endpoint and also improve the latency of requests to your API or underlying legacy application by retrieving that data from cache. So not just relational databases such as um, Amazon Neptune also can uh, take advantage of ElastiCache. Amazon Neptune is our purpose-built high-performance graph database, and it can take advantage of caching layer on top by caching your most commonly used and most resource-intensive queries. So far, we briefly looked at the challenges we have in relational databases with horizontal scaling and cost. We looked at how memory-based caching will address those two challenges. We will now dive into the caching strategies to learn how applications can cache data. So starting off here with lazy loading pattern, as the name implies, the data is loaded into the cache only when necessary. Here is a diagram that shows how it works. When client receives a request for a data element, the first step it takes is to read that data element from the cache. It looks for it in the cache. If the data element is not available in cache, which is then called a cache miss, it will fetch the data from RDS. The third step it takes after is to write that response from RDS into the cache. So the subsequent read request coming to the client for that value will be read from the cache, avoiding unnecessary database calls and taking advantage of speed of cache retrieval. So the cache itself is a key value store. So the cache requests are based on a key. You will need to retrieve the value of the cache object using the key. Quick run through of advantages and disadvantages here. Advantages are lazy loading pattern avoids unnecessary data in cache because only the data that is read by the clients is cached. Cache can be repopulated any time in order to keep it in sync with your primary data store or primary backend application. You get immediate benefit because as soon as you read the data from source, it gets written to the cache, making it available for all subsequent reads. Cache mails may be expensive on the disadvantages side because if you have your application that is receiving many thousands of requests per second all at once, they all can miss the cache and these requests can queue up, causing a cache storm. Until that data is written by the first read, the request may be queued. The second disadvantage here, since we are not updating the cache every time, data is updated in the back end cache may not be fresh or in sync with your database. Here we'll quickly look at the code example that uses lady, lazy loading pattern for caching. Listed are the steps here on the right side of the slide. First attempt to read the request value from the cache. If there was a miss, 
which means the cache does not have that value, you need to read from the source. Once read, the third step is to write to the cache so that it is available in the cache for all the subsequent reads, eliminating the need to go back to the source for that data. On the left side of the slide here, we have the code example, the definition of the SQL at the top, used as the key, and we'll get to MD5 hash in a little bit. First step, we try to get the data from cache. If found, we return that, and you're seeing pickle here, which is the Python framework. If it is not found, we read from the source the RDS code that is reading from the source. Then at the bottom of the code, you're executing set ex command, which is used to set the red value into the cache so that it is available for all the subsequent reads. Here we have same code example with two different SQLs. This is to say the code works for any SQL statement. It is a reusable piece of code snippet that can be used to cache any result set of any SQL. It's a simple implementation we have here for lazy load caching pattern. So we mentioned key value earlier and we talked about how cache objects retrieved are retrieved using a key. Let's quickly look at key recommendations for caching. Usually the select statement itself is used as the key to store the value, which is the result set of that SQL. In this example, the select statement is retrieving the sum of orders for a given customer. The value of it needs to be cached. In order to cache that value, we need to have a unique key via which we can retrieve that value later. That key is basically the entire select statement, which is the unique value for that customer. If we use the string of this SQL as a key, the length is too long. If we convert the SQL statement to an MD5 hash, the size is much smaller. In this case, it went from 140 bytes to 32 bytes. So the recommendation here is to use the MD5 hash version for the key to stay away from increasing the size of your cache keys. Next, let's look at write through patterns used to keep the data in the cache in sync with your database or the underlying storage or application layer. Write through is used to cache objects when the database is being written to. This is write through behind pattern, which is relying on Lambda trigger here in the back end to, to complete the cache sync. First step to client calls an update operation on the database. Second step is the data written to DynamoDB, and then it will trigger Lambda function, which writes it to the cache. So repeating the steps here, write to the source first, trigger AWS Lambda function, and Lambda function updates the cache. So on the advantages, data is never stale because the latest updated data is written to cache as well, along with the source. Write latency is better tolerated than read latency because we are attempting to write during every update to your source proactively. It then becomes available in the cache for the clients who are reading this data. Disadvantage is that unnecessary data can be cached as every data written to the source is cached irrespective of whether it is read or not. Other disadvantage is that data may be read multiple times prior to the updates. And that means all the reads were serviced from the source, not from the cache. And that is a delayed benefit mentioned here. Let's look at a simplified write through pattern. Here we are simply having the client write to the cache instead of having a Lambda trigger. Client receives a write request. It is written to the source first, RDS in this case. Then the client code writes to the cache. These are the same set of advantages and disadvantages here. One additional advantage here is that this is a simplified design that avoids the backend triggers. Code example for write-through. 
here we're trying to update the location value for user ID Mike. This is a hash object you're seeing here on the left. The RDS code on the right to update the database using the SQL. Once the database is updated, we update the cache using the Redis command hset that you're seeing at the bottom of the code snippet here. So listing the Redis commands here, headset you saw in the previous slide is setting the data element within the value of a key. Here in this case, it is a location for the key user ID mic and headscan is used to list all the elements for that user ID key, which is mic. Quick comparison of the two strategies that we looked at. Lazy load patterns benefit is that it only caches data that is read right through caches everything that is being written. In case of lazy load, the cache is populated as the reads occur. And in case of write through cache, the cache is populated as the updates occur. Write through will always keep the data in sync with your primary, whereas lazy loading data can get stale. That would be the reason why you could combine these two strategies, which means you can use the lazy load to populate your data in cache as it is read you can then use write through to keep the data in sync with the latest data that is being updated in your database or backend application. By combining these two strategies, you can leverage the benefits of these two patterns. Sometimes you want to pre-populate the data upfront when your application comes up. That may be after a new release or a new feature is deployed in those cases, we can use an ETL process to pre-populate or warm up the cache with the data and then keep that data in sync using the write-through pattern. Before I hand this over to Roberto, just wanted to quickly walk you through Redis data structures. Elasticache for Redis uses Redis data store as its engine. Redis is not a plain key value store. It is actually a data structure server. Redis provides many advanced data structures, which are listed here in this diagram. These data structures can be used to store simple to complex data elements easily as values in its key value store. The data structures listed here are string, list, hash, set, sorted set, streams, hyperlog logs, and geospatial. Starting with string, it is used for storing simple values, for example, average of six months of data. String can also be used for simple caches or counters. Hash can be used for object storage. Example use cases for hash would be storing or caching a large result set from the database where you can easily modify any value. Or storing a response from an API call made to your backend application that is a slow performing application and hash object can be used for that purpose as well. We have list data structure here, which is a linked list. This can be used to implement queues and set. These are unique unordered collection of values and can be used to store unique visitors to your site or used to store buckets for your time series data. And sorted set is sorted based on its score. And this data structure and built-in commands can be used for a number of different use cases example would be location-based applications. We have Redis streams here. This is an append-only data structure and it models the log data structure and the operations provided with Redis allow consumers of the stream to wait for the new data being appended to the stream. And not to forget all of this functionality and rich data structure features can be leveraged without compromising on the speed. The read latency continues to be in sub milliseconds for your cache. With that, I would like to now turn this over to Roberto, who will walk you through how you can boost your PostgreSQL database performance with Elastic Cache. Hello, my name is Roberto Luna Rojas. Thank you, Sashi, for having me. Uh, I go by Robert, so that's easy for everybody. And let's dive deep into how we can make use of Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis to cache or add a caching layer on top of PostgreSQL. So this lab that we have prepared talks about how we can make use of or showcases 
the performance improvements that can be achieved when using Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis to cache relational database queries. This incorporates database query cache test harness that performs semi-random queries on a, MICE, on a PostgreSQL RDS database and caches results in Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis. The application then collects statistics on performance of cache versus database queries. But first, let's analyze some of the metrics that are important for us. First one being the cache TTL or time to live. You can control the freshness of your cache data by applying a time to live or expiration to your cache keys. So as you mentioned that Redis is a key value data store, right? So each one of those will have to have an associated TTL. After the set times has passed, the key is deleted from the cache and access to the origin data store or our source of truth, it is required. Then we also have the different number of queries. This number specifies the number of possible queries that can be performed. Fewer possible queries will improve in the chances of finding an item in the cache. If the set is higher, then the higher chance that the item will not be in the cache, thus we will have to go and retrieve it from the database. Then we have number of calls, which is the different the total amount of requests that we're going to perform. We also have the query complexity. Complex queries, like Sashi mentioned, right? They will take longer because they will have to scan more data as well as join in multiple tables in a database environment and consume much more resources. Caching these results of the queries can result in more performance gains and reduce the utilization of the database. That's what we saw from the uh, diagram. Now we will see it in action. So let's start from something really, really simple, right? We're gonna go to very few number of calls, very uh, few number of different queries, right? So we're only gonna perform 50 requests to uh, 10 uh, different queries. And this is a very low uh, query complexity onto our PostgreSQL. Let's see how this reacts. Wow, that was pretty fast, right? And actually, we can take a look at the query that we perform onto our RDS instance, right? So it's a very simple, just retrieving an item and actually the top item, right? So it's one item from our reviews table. And the only thing that we're making is uh, adding this value to make it a, a, a random query, right? So it's not repeated. But in essence, uh, Postgres was pretty fast in this sense, right? Because there's no much request, the throughput is pretty good. So we were able to respond back or it was able to, to get a response within also a sub millisecond, right? So in this case, it's 596 microseconds. Whereas Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis gave us responses from the cache within 195 microseconds. This is about two and a half times faster, right? And our number of calls corresponds to the different amount of, of queries that we have. And that's what gives us this cache hit ratio. So that means the number of queries that we performed totally was 50 and the different queries are 10, right? So this is that about 80% ratio that we will expect. So from the total, since there are only 10 different, that means the 31st 10 times that we find different queries, we will go to the source of truth. The rest, we will find them in the cache. And we can see this on our log. By we are towards the end of the, of, of the run, we only have cache hits. Let's see how this changes as we keep increasing the number of different queries as well as the number of calls. Let's make this an even 200. Let's make it even a little bit more, 300. And we're gonna make 3000 calls, right? So this is gonna give us a cash or a ratio about 10 to one. So we will expect to have a cash hit ratio of about 90%. Let's run it and let's see how this builds up. Okay, let's go and see, take a look at our log. Yep, towards the end, we only see cache hits, right? So that's perfect. Then we can see the different, all these are different queries, but still fairly, fairly simple. And thus, PostgreSQL is still giving us responses within sub milliseconds, right? So it's able to say, okay, within 700 microseconds, get this your response. 
but Elasticash still outperforms it, right? So now we have responses of over uh, 167 microseconds. That's pretty good. But what happens if we change the complexity, right? We, uh, Sashi mentioned uh, more difficult queries uh, are going to take longer, right? So let's see how that actually pans out. Now we can see that the progress, it's a little bit slower than the previous times, right? And let's take a look at our log. So we see a mix of cache hit and cache misses. That means some of the queries that we're performing are not found in the cache. Hence, we have to go to the source of truth to retrieve the data. Once we have it, we save it onto the cache. Towards the end, it seems like it finished. Yes, it did. So we're at 100%. And let's analyze our queries, right? So what are we doing? In this case, as we can see, it's not just longer a single uh, field that we're retrieving. In this case, we're doing some sub extreme operations, doing alias, and then we're also doing a count, as well as doing a group by, which will inquire into a table scan, right? So this is from our same reviews table. And we're still retrieving only one item at a time, one row. But let's see how this impacted RDS. So PostgreSQL gave us responses within 14 milliseconds. So it's way over uh, the, the previous number that we had, that it was around 600, right? So this has been uh, about 30 uh, times slower than, than before. And um, in comparison to that, we still see Amazon Elastic Cache outperforming it and keeping it under 200 microseconds as it was before. So what this means is Amazon Elastic Cache is not being impacted by the complexity of the request or the query itself. For us, it's just a key and a value store. That's why we can see this huge improvement in performance. And even so, we will see that, well, there's some, some something strange in here, right? Our cache hit ratio is not 90 or 80% as we will expect to, actually 90% as we've seen before. We have 3,000 total calls and to 300 different queries. So we will expect this number to be higher, right? So that means we did a lot of cache misses. How can we fix this? This is when it comes the time to live, right? So that ability for the cache to hold onto data that is good enough so you can keep it into your caching layer for a longer period of time. Of course, this depends on the use case. Like Sashi, Sashi mentioned, uh, the TTL will impact into how fresh or stale your data could be. But if we feel like comfortable to say, okay, we're gonna make this an even 15 seconds instead of three, well, let's rerun this and see how we can have a different cache hit ratio. We see our progress keeps going faster actually. And what do you think is that? Well, because towards the end, we were able to get all of our data out of the cache. So pure hits, right? So in this sense, uh, RDS for PostgreSQL gave us responses within 15 milliseconds, so about 15,200 microseconds per call. And Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis was still giving us responses very close uh, to under 200 microseconds, right? In this case, 139 microseconds to be exact in average. And we see our cache hit ratio go all the way up to 90%, which is what we will expect. So keep in mind that your freshness factor is considered into the TTL or time to live. So if you want to keep this closer or over to 90%, or in this case, actually, we recommend or a good number to be is around 80%. Uh, that's uh, something that may, gives you the, the understanding that you are doing the cache hits that you require without actually storing everything in cache because at that point you are completely stale. Or if you are on the 50s, like we were before, that means you're making too many queries to the source of truth. And we can, we can start seeing a big difference in, in performance about the number of requests that each can handle, right? So we have over 7,100 7, on Elasticache and about 66 on RDS. And as we keep improving or in enhancing the query complexity, we will see this even higher. For the high query complexity, I'm gonna 
reduce these to about a hundred different calls, we're going to make it a thousand total. So we keep that 90% ratio and let's see how this reacts. Let's go all the way to our log to understand the different queries. We can see our cache warming up. And in this case, the other two were actually fairly simple queries, right? We now see a very different and more realistic query to, that could be implemented where we have string operations like before, but now we have a join, right? So we have a review stable joined with itself. We have aliases and we are um, responding also with different reviews IDs. And at the same time, we're grouping uh, and also re returning 20 rows at a time. So this looks more like a realistic example of what a database query will be. And you can see the big performance improvement that it had uh, on RDS. That means the responses were now all the way to 68 milliseconds. And Amazon Elastic Cache is still under 200 microseconds, right? In this case, 170 microseconds to be exact. So again, to prove in the point that as query complexity grows, your RDS will become slower, whereas Elastic Cache will not. And we can see the big inform, uh, performance that has impacted RDS, right? So this goes directly to the throughput that you can expand, right? So uh, while you were doing really good latency when the queries were simple, as query complexity grows, your throughput will be directly impacted. And we are still under 90% of our cache hit ratio. So that means our TTL is good enough. But as you can think, if we reduce this, we may not get that 90% cache hit ratio. Oh, we still did. So this one is still pretty good. It's something that you have to consider and adjust to your specific use case needs. As I said, this is part of our uh, uh, immersion day lab. So if you want to learn more, we have prepared uh, a, a lab as part of our immersion day for Amazon Elastic Cache. And then you can learn everything about what we're doing here. But just really quickly, I would like to give you an overview of what this is, right? So this is very similar to what Sashi showed us about your compute, right? So you have your application. In our case, this is a Flask uh, Python application that first goes to our cache. If it doesn't find it, then it goes and retrieves the data from our source of truth and then stores it back onto our cache, right? So this is a very simple uh, diagram. Then this is the whole application, how it's built on our AWS and deployed. Uh, it's under a region, and then you have our own VPC, we have our Bastion host, and then we have our RDS as well as our, our Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis cluster. And then this is uh, what this uh, container ECS is, is running, the actual application. So we query these two data sources. Now let's take a look at how this is implemented. So we have our fetch function on our Python code that receives an SQL string statement. This is agnostic to the, what the query may be. So we just receive that command, we format it, and then we generate a random value. We wanted to make this completely random to not to cheat, right? And then we create our uh, hashing to um, go with what Sashi showed us, right? It's a good best practice to use a string that has a, a, def a defined limit of, of, of length instead of using the whole string that could be uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of bytes. So once we have our key defined, we go and try to fetch it from the source of the, uh, from our cache. So using Redis, doing the get command, providing the key. And if we do find the value, that means it was on the cache. So we simply just load the data and return the value. Perfect. But what if we didn't? Well, if we don't find the data on the cache, we go and read it from the source of truth, in this case, from MySQL or in our particular purpose from PostgreSQL, execute the command, and then capture the metrics and save onto Redis as well. So we have what this is PCX. So P stands for uh, milliseconds. So that means we want to set our value and expire it 
up to a certain milliseconds, providing that time to live. And then we have our key and our value, and we simply return it. So in essence, this is what is powering this uh, lab, this application that you can see here. And Sashi also mentioned that anything that can be queried can be cached, right? So going to our S3 example, we have a similar lab that it supports getting data out of an S3 bucket. So it's very similar. We have the time to live, the different objects, and the total number of calls. And the file size will be what is similar to the complexity of our queries. So we can run our test. And in this case, yeah, it's running, running, running. We see a bunch of hits towards the end. And we can see the difference in response times from Amazon S3 giving us responses within 42 milliseconds, close to 43 milliseconds, and Amazon Elasticash around 400 microseconds, right? So this is about over 100 times faster, right? And why do you think this is a little bit higher in, in actually about double as it was with, um, with the result from PostgreSQL? The difference is in the data itself, right? So we mentioned that network is gonna be our bottleneck. So you have to be frugal as well onto the amount of data that is traveling through the wire. So in this case, we're dealing with objects. This may be JSON files, for example. So in this case, that's why we see an increase into the response time. But let's analyze how this changes if the file size changes as well. Let's run our test again. S3 is giving us a similar response time, in this case, 45 milliseconds. And Amazon Elastic Cache, it's not being impacted, right? So it's still 427 microseconds. It's definitely it's slightly more than very few bytes traveling through the wire, but it's not considerable. We can see a change as well on the large object. This is going to be much uh, bigger. So I believe it's 10 megabytes. So we have responses from S3 coming within 49 milliseconds, close to 50 milliseconds, right? So it wasn't impacted significantly because pretty much it just added the network time to send more data through the wire. And similarly, we see those responses being affected as well on Amazon Elastic Cache in time. But as, as again, it's still much faster, uh, about uh, 10 times faster coming out of Elastic Cache versus the source of truth, which is S3. So with that, thank you very much for your time.